welcome to this edition of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and uh, you have just been seeing some highlights, some scenes from the public art installation that we are here to talk about today. I, uh, by we, I mean I am joined, um, as I hope to be each and every year going forward as these public art installations uh, continue to proceed. I am joined first of all by uh, with uh, by excuse me by Cecily Miller, who is uh, the curator for public art and community engagement at the Arlington uh, Commission for Arts and Culture. Cecily, thanks, um, James. Yes, yeah, good Happy to, to see be you. Here. Absolutely, yeah. and also by Nilu Muchala, who is this year's um, artist in residence. Um, and who is responsible for the installation that we are going to be uh, talking about today and hopefully you guys are all enjoying already. Um, Cecily, I wanted to start with you though um, because uh, we were here uh, a while back uh -huh. um, in the studio pre-pandemic to talk about the first of these kinds of installations, Persistence. Uh, with Michelle Luigi last year and yourself. And I know that the ACAC, this is a big part of what it is that you guys want to do is have these large-scale community engagement projects um, that also involve, of course, artists like Nilu. Um, so if you don't mind, just tell us, like, uh, what is the genesis of this public, this, this part of the ACAC agenda, and then how did this particular one come about? Sure, okay. Well, um, people think of a lot of different things when you say public art. They might think of a 19th century sculpture of a man on horseback commemorating a war. They might think of um, benches in a park that have been painted with colorful patterns or even a mural street art. Um, these tend to be more permanent. Um, the approach that we've taken in Arlington is to do public art that is more temporary more ephemeral, might be here for a month, might be here for a year or a couple of years. And part of the reason for that is so that we can be flexible and timely and sort of um, respond to what's going on in the now. Uh, and also there are technical reasons that um, it, it, it can be uh, easier for an artist to create something that's not made out of bronze and granite and mm. has to last for, you know, 50 years and be engineered for that. So um, starting with this idea of kind of nimbleness and responsiveness and doing temporary projects, we um, grew to really value engaging the public, not just as an audience, not just as the people who would see this art, but as people who participated in the making in some way, contributed to the meaning. So that emerged as a priority for us to, to, to really try to incorporate the voices and perspective of the community and have people have a sense of ownership over the pieces that are led, very much led though, by professional artists who have extraordinary skill and insight and ability. Um, then the second kind of philosophical part of the way that we do uh, public art is to address the issues that matter to people. I was actually uh, once, when working for another city, um, criticized for having a piece that weighed in on a controversy that um, people in political office had a set opinion about, and I said, that's what public art is for, to give people a place to talk about what matters to them. And even though I was told that early in my career that no, Art is for something that goes over the sofa. <laughs> I have continued to believe that art is a really powerful way to address the circumstances that we live in. So Michelle's project was looking at the problem of plastic pollution, which has been so important to activists in Arlington. There's been organizing from the elementary schools to the Zero Waste Committee mm -hmm. um, to try to eliminate this threat really serious threat to our environment and that project was very much it, it we persisted in it the title of it is persistence but it was derailed in many ways by covid because the whole thing was uh, organized to bring people together to crochet and share materials and make fabricate together Neela's project we took in 
to more than took into account the fact that there was a pandemic going on. It's really about the pandemic, about the experience that we've all lived through, um, the thing that was probably most on people's mind for the last year. Um, and it came about because um, I have worked with Nilu before, and therefore I follow her on Instagram. She's a wonderful artist, always kind of uh, coming up with new ideas and new images. And these drawings began to appear on Instagram that were her personal work, uh, which she'll talk more about, mm -hmm. um, reflecting on the pandemic. And so um, I did a really uh, great project with her called Rhetoric of Opposites on the Bikeway that some people may have seen, which paired opposite words on the pavement of the bikeway and mm -hmm. got people thinking about divisive language. So I got in touch with her essentially and said, is there a way to build an artist in residence project on this, on this work and to share this, this work with the community? Well, I'm, I, I, on behalf of the community, I welcome the renewal of this partnership because I do remember rhetoric of opposites myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, from my time on the bike path, and it was, it was, it made me think, mm -hmm. and and I'm sure it did that for others as well, um, as will this project. So the project, and let's let's start to dig into that a little bit. Um, the project is reflections on our pandemic experience, mm -hmm. and um, I'm struck by the fact that the genesis of that, though, is a very personal, very individual individual uh, reaction to this thing that we were all dealing with. So we had our individual reactions ourselves. Yours took a particular form. So why don't you mm -hmm. start from that sure. um, and then just kind of bring us into how that moved from a very personal thing to becoming this very public thing. Yeah. Um, and actually the title of the project reflecting on our, our pandemic experience um, is definitely crucial because it wasn't just mine. Um, so in thinking about, you know, what we were going to call it, um, the hour is definitely a very important component of this public art project. Um, going back to, I would say, March 13, 2020, the day of the lockdown mm -hmm. in Arlington and surrounding communities, um, chaos, fear, uncertainty, schools were shut down. We had seen an inkling of that because one of the schools, public schools in Arlington, the elementary school had been shut down before that for a day or two, but this was the big one. Mm -hmm. And there was just so much unknown. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a graphic designer by training and have always been you know, playing with the art side as well, trained in both um, for my degrees. And it seemed like a moment that I just needed to get to start doing something that would regulate me over the course of the next few weeks, not supposing that <laughs> it would carry on, extend into right. a year Everything at least, if not Everything was just more. a few weeks out, right? Yeah. At, at that first moment, yeah. and yeah. So the day after the, the day of the lockdown, March 13, 2020, which is very important to me personally, although you know the shutdowns could have happened in different times in different communities, this was the first sketch I made trying to capture the idea of this virus, you know, spiraling uh, uncontrollably or even the chaos, you know, internally that some people were feeling just total um, craziness, you know, running to grocery stores or getting sanitized or cleaning equipment. Nobody knew whether you should touch your friend or not, see your family, say goodbye, whatever. Um, and then through the course of the next few weeks, it started becoming, you know, a sort of practice where I started playing with different textures, different colors. So here are a few examples of some of the things, you know, I started creating different shapes um, and really thinking about, you know, how to sort of channel myself into this regular practice that could then stabilize me at some level, um, stabilize the family, therefore the community, and, you know, you keep expanding outwards. Um, can I just ask you a question before you go further? Um, and that is I'm struck by how abstract um, mm -hmm. what you produced was and how it's about color and texture and, um, and patterns and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, was that because it's of a piece with how your art usually is or was that in response to the feelings mm -hmm. or, uh, that you were having or yeah. both? Or Good question. I mean, as a trained designer, I'm always deciphering messages for other people to send to an audience. Mm -hmm. 
So this is definitely more personal. I mean, this was my second drawing, and it's much more looking, you know, in contrast to the first one that was swirling. This is more about resilience or being determined. It has the idea of roots or plants. This is the third one, and this one is all about grids. It actually talks about the idea of six feet of separation, who's contaminated mm. with the red spots, who isn't, but this idea of like living in a grid system where now we can't like, you know, get too close to anybody. So just be in your space and be away from everything and alone at some level. I, I love that the drawings have these, um, these meanings that you mm -hmm. can deconstruct. But I also think um, you described them as meditative, mm -hmm. and it was a powerful way to kind of take a time out, you know, and have a quiet space and mm -hmm. see where the marks led you. And I would suspect that some of the time it was unconscious, you yeah. know, and, and you were just working with the feelings that you were experiencing yeah. and processing them. And I, I love seeing them here and their physicality, and you can tell from these rounded corners that some of the pages they're from sketch pads mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. others are fragments from another notepad and um, you know I picture you at your kitchen table or your desk um, working on these and, and accumulating them and 365 right mm -hmm. before you stopped yeah. marking each day. So James, I did continue for 300, well, I went up to about eight months and then, you know, I was rolling around October, November. Okay, gotta do the 365, <laughs> I got to finish the year. Mm -hmm. So luckily for me, the pandemic was continuing for another year. Luckily. <laughs> luckily. <huh>? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there was no end in sight, at least for us who are you're not in the health, uh, you know, medical professions who had gotten vaccines potentially earlier. So kept going till March 13, 2021. Mm -hmm. By that time, Cecily and I had already started talking about you know, the idea of bringing this into the public space and how can we get it out of the digital space on Instagram and um, you know, do something in Arlington in the community with the community component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say that the, the, what we've been calling an artist in residence is an attempt to give the artist this time and space to, to not only do their own private work, but to take <clears throat> on that community engagement piece. And Neelu is an experienced interviewer. Uh, she's a storyteller, a story collector and storyteller. Mm -hmm. And so she immediately saw, responded to that challenge with the idea of interviewing people. And we were planning to do it by Zoom. You know, that mm -hmm. was one of the things about this project. It was designed as something that could connect people, but in the way that we could during a pandemic. Right, obviously the, the project itself at that moment yeah. in March earlier this exactly. year, as you guys conceived of it, it was hard to tell still mm -hmm. when we were going to be able to come Impossible, out of this. Impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you had to be you know, working with what was right in front of you at that time. Um, I am struck though by the, the fact that as you pointed out earlier, Cecily, in talking about these, these particular projects that the ACAC sponsors, you, that community engagement piece was always a, mm -hmm. an important part that people, as you say, not simply be consumers <laughs> and appreciators, but also participants. And then obviously Neelu took, you, you took that to an entirely different level um, in this project by directly incorporating the testimony and the experiences as expressed to you of a bunch of different people in the community. But go ahead and tell us exactly sure. how that worked. So I mean, one of the first steps was to figure out what were the questions we were gonna ask. Also in tandem, looking for the site. I think mm -hmm. that was a very important piece and we landed upon the site at Minotomy Rocks Park. It's a neighborhood I live in and where I go very regularly. Um, but there was a space in the woods where this beautiful Andy Goldsworthy type sculpture on the ground had already taken place with a lot of branches, a circular formation around this one single tree. And um, there was a bit of a clearing around that and I definitely wanted to um, use that. Um, and that was an anonymous sculpture we found out later created by a, a neighbor five mm -hmm. years ago with mm -hmm. his seven-year-old daughter. And interestingly, he was inspired by um, things he had seen on a safari trip in Africa that were constructed by people to create safe spaces. Protective. Protective, yeah. He called yeah. it a nest or like a, you know, or the Maasai tribesmen and they create this sort of 
um, wall around mm -hmm. their, you mm -hmm. know, temporary village that will protect them from, you know, outside elements anyway. Um, it already had so much motion on the ground, this particular site, and a lot of trees surrounding it as well. So it just seemed like a perfect space to come and contemplate and be peaceful and calm away from the chaos, you know, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we were very fortunate. We got approval from the, you know, Parks Department. And the so. Friends of Monotomy Rocks Park have mm -hmm. been yes. very supportive and have yes. even contributed to mm -hmm. making the project possible. But I just wanted to say that it was core to Nilu's vision that people have this place they could connect with nature. Mm -hmm. Because this was meant to be healing and contemplative, um, a place where people could find resilience, mm -hmm. peaceful, and all of that mm -hmm. is is there in nature. And we're so lucky in Arlington to have these beautiful green spaces and especially this this park, which is such a jewel. Yeah. Yeah, and we opened the show with uh, just a, a little bit of footage from the installation and people could see the banners or flags waving in the air. And um, let me ask you just to, again to guide us through how did it work once you decided, hey, mm -hmm. I'm going to go beyond my own personal experience and, and working with and through Cecily and the ACAC, I'm going to extend this out into mm -hmm. the community. So I assume you, you did interview folks, et cetera. What's you know, connect for us yeah. uh, that impulse to what we can actually see in monotony. Yeah. Okay. monotony. Yep. Sure. So, I mean, Cecil and I came up with a you know series of ten questions, um, and it started with taking people back to the beginning of lockdown and then bringing them forward up till today. And you know, what is their experience? What have they seen? So, slightly contemplative and definitely reflective. Um, through some official channels. We got, were very fortunate to interview quite a few people in the town. The um, you know, Department of Public Works, uh, Mike, I think, is the head, mm -hmm. uh, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, who will be you know, here later, um, who else, planning department, uh, the fire the chief. Fire. Mm -hmm. So this was, I was so excited just by you know, a couple of those interviews, just having that energy of like the townsfolk into the pandemic, you know, project. I think that gives a lot of weight to it and to understand what they were going through. Right. Talk about the frontline mm -hmm. workers. Exactly. I mean, and the, the also the um, <coughs> the head of circulation for the libraries. Mm -hmm. And it, that I should mention the the libraries have been a wonderful partner on this whole project, right, a yes. key partner, mm -hmm. and they. People needed their books during the pandemic, so the <laughs> library was uh, like busy, uh, at least twice as busy, if not three times as busy as it normally mm -hmm. is, while still dealing with their own, keeping their own staff safe. Right. So these yes. are the kind of issues that yeah. Milu got a front exactly see, uh, uh, seeing how they unfolded for and then regular residents too definitely you know some essential workers as in grocery stores and other public health and medical also talking i also spoke to some youth um, a lot of elderly residents i interviewed the tenant president at drake village um, so really trying to get through you know a big slice of arlington all different professions um, all different facets of life and teachers as well, because they doubly had to take on a lot of the weight and responsibility in the 2020, 21 school year and the fall and spring um, of how to like pivot to this remote academy versus you know hybrid versus in school and how we're going to manage all of that. I do also want to mention the library is going to have a recording of all the audio interviews. Um, so we originally started thinking we would do 15 to 20 interviews. We've ended up with at least 75, wow. 40 of them or 45 were face to face that I did either via Zoom or in person in our backyard as it was safe. And um, that so is- So the, the library is going to be kind of archiving basically exactly. these yeah. interviews and, the, and making the, them available. The library had established a COVID archive, mm -hmm. sure a community-based yes. COVID archive. And we saw this as actually a way to support that mm -hmm. archive. Um, to activate it and yeah. the questionnaire that Nilu finalized that is online will be online will be online for the next year <coughs> so people can continue to share their stories and actually we'd like to get that message out mm -hmm. that um, it's not too late it's too late to have your work translated into visual form for the installation mm -hmm. but not too late to have your voice included in history and we all know 
it's important that you know regular people who've been through history share their perspective so that when people look back on these mm -hmm. events they know how we were all impacted and the truth of this situation or the multiple truths right. the variety of truths well as you point out it is it may be too late for their words to be uh, reflected visually um, for this particular project. Let me ask you, how are the people who are fortunate enough to be, mm -hmm. their expressions have yeah. found a new form here? Uh, how, how did that happen? And how, did, and how can people experience that now? If they go to Monotomy Rocks Park, yeah. what are they gonna see if they go to yeah. Kickstand Cafe, et cetera? Yeah. Um, and if, if they go to the park, uh, of course, you know, there are 100 meditation flags. So what we've done is taken 50 of my original flags that I did out of the three, 365 and combined it with 50 community interviews. I've selected those to represent, you know, a wide, um, I guess, um, cross-section of Arlington, um, Arlington stories. And um, each of the flags of the community interviews have a word attached to them. Mm. This word isn't necessarily what someone said, but it's the feeling. I mean, they could have said it, but it could also be based on, you know, a kind of emotion or feeling that the person was having at some point during the pandemic or during their interview. Um, it and captures yes. the sort of the core meaning yeah. of their story. Mm -hmm. And the process for me was pretty much, you know, going, obviously interviewing them and uh, then going back and, you know, trying to figure out what were those high points in the audio interview and then finally sitting down and translating all of them. There's a difference between the interview um, images and my original ones. My original ones are a lot more raw and are done without so much, um, I would say, translation. Mm -hmm. And definitely the community interviews, they tell a story in a very different way. And the way the marks are made are trying to communicate something about that specific person's experience. Mm -hmm. So my training as a designer has come into play, you know, with some of those flags. But the way they fly at Monotomy is, uh, you know, they're alternating on each length of rope and there are eight trees that radiate from the central tree, it radiates out almost like a maypole. Um, so that's that what the installation is about. We had a crew about. of uh, yeah. arborists yes. um, helping us. Uh, they were climbing ladders and installing at Nilu's you know, um, instructions. Mm -hmm. And a, an incredible amount of organization and precision went into her f measuring the space between each tree trunk and figuring out exactly how many flags and mm -hmm. which string would radiate to this tree and to this tree and the effect is really um, I mean, it kind of takes your breath away it's 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 quite wonderful and changes with the light uh, mm -hmm. the light filters yeah. through the trees and illuminates the flags and um, you have a lovely way of saying uh, that the uh, tradition of prayer flags mm -hmm, yeah. the idea yeah, exactly that I mean, the whole the format wind. of the flag itself is you know definitely the Buddhist prayer flags which have been around for um, millennia, I should say, mm -hmm. and um, but not the idea that you know God will be dispersed around. It's more like peace and contemplation will be provided for everything it's surrounding. So just this idea again during the pandemic to have a space that you know brings you there and you can feel some sort of solitude. Like that was the idea. I should say in contrast to that, um, right. Kickstand Cafe was. Um, Emily Shea, who is a co-owner at Kickstand, she's one of she was one of my interviewees, and they pivoted and you know ended up running their cafe outdoors, um, outdoor seating, um, sometime last summer. So um, I approached her, and um, you know she agreed to have a different sort of component of the installation in a much more busy social area, also that belongs to the cultural district. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a set of twenty. We have a set of 13 flags, so 26 flags flying at kickstand. Mm -hmm. But those are word and image flags. So it has pull quotes from the interviews of 13 interviewees, and they will be up there as well, as long as the Monotomy Park one is up. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the um, both the continuity, but also the contrast between these two installations, mm -hmm. because a fundamental principle of successful and meaningful um, public art is that it's site-specific that it responds to the place where you experience it. And so the one that's so social, it's like the town meeting right, place, it is, right? Yep. Um, yeah. That that's where you get these fragments mm -hmm. of the story um, 
transparent. You know, there they are. You can read them. And it's more mysterious in Monomy Rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to kind of imaginatively mm -hmm. uh, respond to these, as well as you have that uh, space to go inside. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just add one other personal note, which is uh, I mentioned earlier, I live adjacent to Monotomy and lucky enough to do that, and so therefore spend a s certain amount of time in the park on a regular basis. So I've been able to go to the installation four times so far, and each time I have focused on, different things have come to me. I won't even say that I've taken mm -hmm. much agency at it, uh, in it. And, and I think that that's what you, you have offered as well, by having this in a place that is accessible to all, but also separate from the kind of pace of yep, life. Absolutely. That we, we do slip into that kind of contemplative space uh, when, when mm -hmm. we're there, and it, it rewards revisiting in a way that you know, wonderful art always does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I mean, I do have one thing to add, which is, I mean, I don't look at myself so much as a translator, more like a conduit, and just almost inhaling a lot of these interviews. I mean, did wreck my nervous system for a while, but the minute you know I started sketching it out, it was incredible. Just to get some of those people's stories out there on paper was really you know important for me and to be part of this community project. Well, we are going to hear from a number of uh, the participants, your, your interviewees, uh, a, a nice smattering, a nice cross-section from uh, different uh, perspectives and, and, and participation uh, within and reactions to the pandemic, and we look forward to that. Um, but before uh, we move into that part of today's, uh, today's show, I just wanted to ask you one last thing, which is, um, for you personally, this is a, this seems you were just describing how um, there was a, a sense of, of being, if not if not assaulted, you 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 were carrying a mm -hmm. lot. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so this must have been an extremely full experience for mm -hmm. you in many ways. How what what do you feel that on a very personal level you're taking out of this? Well, it was my transition. Uh, point. I think, you know, I got vaccinated during the process and then just having the project up and out, uh, I could almost leave physically and even emotionally leave the pandemic behind just a little bit mm -hmm. and start, you know, trying to relish some sense of normalcy. Also with schools going back, you know, my daughter had chosen hybrid to full school. Um, so things were, you know, turning around May or June. That's not to say, you know, we're still will always be aware of some things, you know, coming down the pipeline, but just the fact that it has been, you know, a good way to step out and away from COVID-19 and start attending to other life, you know, things. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Well, as I knew I would, I've really enjoyed um, this conversation. I appreciate you both being here, Cecily. Thank you very thank much. You. And Neela, thank you. Wonderful so work. Yeah. Um, and we are going to go ahead and move on now uh, to a, uh, a broader conversation, a panel conversation that Nilu will uh, moderate between herself and five of the participants in this project. Um, so we'll be right back after a short break. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. Thanks for being here. Hi, um, this, my name is Nilu. We had met earlier, you know, during the recording, and I'm so happy to have five of my interviewees here. I'd like to go down and introduce everyone, and then you know we can launch into a couple of questions. Um, Sanjay Vakil, Adam Chapdelaine, Pietra Czech, Jan Pagliosotti, and Christopher Gauthier. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to interview these five people as part of the larger interview set of um, over 50 people whose community stories and drawings are up hanging at Monotomy Rocks Park. So I'd like to start with you, Adam, as the you know town manager of Arlington, taking you back, you know, again a year and a half ago. Um, where did you feel Arlington was then, and where do you see it now? So maybe we can do a past and present sort of um, check-in, and um, just you know during the uh, process of our interview, you mentioned uh, the humanity of the town departments and how everyone was working together. And um, you know what was that experience like, just managing the chaos of COVID? So I, I guess I would start by saying, like most of the world, in early March we were hearing 
hearing news and hearing reports about the threat of the coronavirus or COVID-19 and taking them seriously, but heeding the guidance of the CDC, suggesting that up to a certain point, there was no threat being caused uh, to Arlington or to people in Massachusetts generally. That rapidly changed in the second week of March. And I remember very clearly being on a call with a number of local leaders um, in various cities and towns in the region on that, I think it was March 12th, uh, maybe it was the Friday, maybe the 9th was the Friday, talking about a need to act very quickly. And I think this was maybe one or two days after the first positive test in Arlington at the Stratton Mm -hmm. School. Um, But Arlington, fortunately, with the guidance of our Health and Human Services Director and other expert staff taking further guidance from the state DPH and CDC, decided to take that, I think, geez, did it start as a 10-day pause? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, probably at that time still thinking very foolishly that this was a Mm -hmm. one, two, three week, maybe a month long issue. Um, But I I do feel proud that I think Arlington was at that point one of the leaders in the state and acting quickly, Mm -hmm. Um, even if we didn't know exactly what the story would be, acting quickly to try to be as protective as possible. Um, Fast forward to today, you know, I I think Arlington suffered loss like every community did over the past uh, 18 or so months. Um, But I think Arlington also fared very well um, in in its trust in science with the, again, the experts we have in our Health and Human Services Department advising us, as well as the fact that we have a very educated, thoughtful populace that I think for the most part has done what they should have done over the past year in terms of masking and then getting access to the vaccine when they were uh, eligible Mm -hmm. to get it. So I think today we're we're in probably as good a place as you could be coming out of what we've all dealt with, um, again, over the past 15 or 18 months. Um, but there's a lot of recovery work to do, and it's not over, right? Mm-hmm. I think we are in a good position today, but there's, there's still more to watch, more to learn, and more to see in terms of how this virus uh, changes and adapts and how we as a, hu- a human people respond to it and what measures might need to be put in place. Um, you know, I don't, from a town perspective, we don't think we're immune to what other parts of the country and other parts of the world are seeing right now. Um, I think we're hopeful that our vaccination rates continue to protect us, but nothing's a given. So we stand ready to see what the next chapter will be. Um, and that's and I, an interesting state to be in. I mean, this idea of being an emergency alert, but then also trying to, I mean, cause definitely the first few months, it sounds like yeah. the town was constantly in that mode, like things were changing even on a daily or weekly basis. Yeah. So now that's kind of, you know, settled a bit more, but maybe preparing if things slightly, you know, shift in the future. Um, It's kind of like a, you know, difficult space to be in. It's interesting that uh, Juliet Kayyem, a CNN contributor and security expert, coined this, but she said, you know, basically people in roles like mine or fire chiefs, police chiefs, health Mm -hmm. and human services directors, Mm -hmm. we are trained to some degree in crisis management, but that crisis is very finite, right? It's like a one or two, maybe not even a one day thing. This is this was obviously felt like an eternity. So we all had to learn how to be, you know, long-term crisis managers. And I think many of us have adapted well in that regard. Um, but you're right now. We're sort of still. We're like coming out of a crisis, still within a crisis, but hopefully better prepared that if we need to roll out more protective measures, m- much more able to do so than we were yeah. rolling back the clock. So Sanjay, I'm going to go to you next um, because um, you were there in the beginning, within the first few days trying to do some sort of emergency response with a product you developed. Yeah, it was interesting. And and it's interesting with Adam talking about um, what the town continues to do, right? One of the things I worry about is stockpiling. And so I'm sort of interested in whether, you know, one of the things that happened back in in last March is that stuff ran out, whether it was gloves or um, masks or sanitizers and so on. So I just wanted to check in with the town as an Arlington resident that we've been stockpiling in, in, in sort of preemptive mode before we get to, you know, whatever whatever's after Delta. Echo? Whatever that is. Epsilon. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Epsilon's are really small. Anyways. <laughs> um, thank you, Nilu. So I, back again in March, there was, uh, I was also sort of on the leading edge of learning that this was happening, partly because I have compatriots uh, at my job in different parts of the world. And so Zurich was in the process of shutting down by the end of February, more or less. Uh, and some of my coworkers were being sent home. And the lack of protective gear was sort of on everybody's mind at the time. So the, the term that I had not heard before, and I hope never to have seared into my brain again, is PPE, 
uh, our healthcare groups need PPE. And so uh, I got an email uh, on a company list basically saying, hey, my brother-in-law's um, working with, with somebody else at, at the Brigham on making some emergency protective gear. And uh, he's doing it with duct tape and a little bit of hope. And could you please find somebody at Google who has a 3D printer and so we can make some prototypes and see if we can do something a little bit more organized. Um, this was sent out by, by a coworker of mine at you know, 10 p.m. on a Saturday night. And by Sunday morning, he had like 180 replies mm -hmm. from everybody, including me, um, saying, yes, I have this stuff. How can I help? What do I do? Uh, and so it grew from there into um, a nonprofit called Masks On. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing mm -hmm. is we, we ended up going in a bunch of different directions to start with and ultimately focused down on um, modifying uh, devices that look like this. So this is a um, full face snorkel mask, um, which is which is a pretty cool toy. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can all see it. And the idea is that, you know, if you remember what old snorkels used to look like, they, they were sort of a piece that went over your face and then there was a big J, J pipe that came in that stuck out. These work slightly differently. They actually cover your entire face. And then there is a uh, tube that comes out here that sticks out like a, like a weird unicorn horn at the top of your head. Um, this piece comes off. And, and what we realized is that if you had the right adapter, you could actually connect it to um, existing filter technology. So this, this turquoise filter on the top that you're seeing here is a standard, it's called an anesthesiology circuit filter. It's mm -hmm. a standard filter that hospitals have. And importantly, it was a filter that wasn't in the consumer space. So you couldn't go buy them up, right? You couldn't, you couldn't they didn't disappear from the shelves. Um, and this ends up being sort of like N100 equivalent. So we ended up raising about two and a half million dollars from some generous donors in and around Boston and beyond. We bought 40,000 of these. And uh, anybody who needed them, we just shipped them to. And you managed to distribute about 10,000 or more? 40, 38,000 got distributed 40, uh, within the US uh, and Haiti. Okay. Uh, and then we had about 2,000 left, and the last of those landed in, in Mumbai, actually, um, yesterday. Yeah. And Excellent. so we're distributing them basically wherever they can go. The need is not here anymore, yeah. right? And so, but there are still healthcare workers and clinicians in India and beyond that, that we're trying to get stuff to. Pietro, I'm going to go to you next. Okay. Um, as a public health professional, I really want to know, you know, what your thoughts were as you saw this thing coming or hearing of it, you know, maybe ahead of the curve. And um, also, yeah, what your responses to that then and now? So um, for me, uh, I guess like Sanjay and Adam both, I was hearing more about it maybe than the general public was because I work in public health. Um, and I was sort of thinking along the lines of a lot of people at that time of, well, we know how to deal with this. We know how to prevent pandemics from getting here. We know how to deal with them once they come here. It'll, it's going to work out. It'll, it won't be too bad. Um, that was how I was feeling in February. And then I started to see that our response was a lot slower than I had expected it to be. Um, and that was when I started to get nervous. And, um, and I actually was um, pleasantly surprised at how quickly uh, Arlington reacted once it became clear that things were a lot worse than had, we had originally thought. Um, in in the closures and that Massachusetts was being Massachusetts and reacting very quickly um, to, to to the risk um, that we saw before us but um, I did I, I was um, surprised I, I am aware that for decades we've had some disinvestment in public health across the board um, internationally globally and in the United States that affected us um, and our ability to respond. Mm -hmm. um, but even knowing that, um, I, I assumed we had capacity that uh, was not necessarily activated uh, quickly enough. Um, and I think we've seen the aftermath of that since then. And what about the vaccination rollout? Do you think that's been a pretty successful rollout um, in terms of I think that there have been um, successes and things have obviously picked up over the past few months uh, rapidly, uh, which is very, um, very encouraging. I do think that um, health equity, which is my specialty, mm -hmm. is um, not a strong suit overall in the United States. And so the response has been very uneven and there are 
um, very vulnerable and most affected and highest risk communities that were not prioritized in the vaccine rollout and are still lagging. In addition to, of course, the fact that uh, the pandemic and public health measures related to the pandemic were politicized early on, and that has also impacted at the national level our ability to have a more even uh, vaccine sure. rollout so yeah. that it's Massachusetts um, overall at the state level is doing great, mm -hmm. but we have pockets of this state, um, or not even just pockets, like Springfield, fourth largest city in New England, and it's, the vaccination rates are, are lower than they, they really should be, and um, there are still access barriers and room for improvement. Um, but I think overall, there are lots of people working very hard on that particular issue, and mm -hmm. things are starting to get better. So John, I'm gonna to go to you next and bring you back to the day before <laughs> the lockdown, actually. <laughs> You're an essential worker in one of the yes. you know spaces, and if you wanna talk about touch upon sure. your experience. Yes. Um, yeah, I work at a grocery store, um, not in Arlington, but in a neighboring town. And um, you know, just work a few days a week, but happened to be working, you know, things were wild anyhow, uh, leading up from, you know, February, March, shortages, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, all of that. But um, I happened to be working the day that they announced schools were closing. And yeah, I think the word that's on mine mm -hmm. is madness because yeah. things did just, people panicked. And, you know, it was, it was unbelievable the amount of food that we sold that day and everything in the store. The shelves were empty and continued to be for a long time. You know, we even, we have a very good process of ordering what we need for the next day's delivery. This, the company just stopped that. They just sent what they could get. You just got what you could get in the store and you figure out how to put it out and people could eat. You know, we'd take polenta and try to make it look like the shelves were full because that was all we could get for that shelf <laughs> at, at times. So we really, you know, it, it was, people were really good about it, but people were really worried about getting f access to food. Yeah, I mean, did you see that anxiety through the customers? Oh, yeah. or oh, yeah. Well, it was both. It was the colleagues. anxiety about getting yeah. food, but it was more, you know, what they were being, what they were worried they were being exposed to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had, you know, a lot of people stopped coming into the store, which made perfect sense. And so they'd have, we'd have one person shopping for the entire extended family, which made a lot of sense, but they'd come in with huge orders then and of course, we were trying to move people through quickly so that you know, we, we did a really good job of keeping the capacity low in the store, sanitizing everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we swam in hand sanitizer mm -hmm. um, before each customer came through, after, you know, it was constant cleaning all the carts, cleaning all the surfaces, the high touch surfaces. And I think we did a really good job mm -hmm. of making the store as safe as it could be. But, um, you know, people were nervous and people continue to be nervous to some extent. Um, you know, everybody sort of figured out their way of handling the anxiety, you know, but um, some in rational ways, some in not too rational ways, but it worked for them. Yeah. Um, you know, some people put everything in a produce bag. Every item gets its own produce bag when they come in. I don't know what that does, but it helps them deal with the anxiety of shopping. Which so. they're going to remove on the conveyor belt anyway. Well, no, we, they didn't want us to, so we'd scan through it. But oh, wow. it's always okay. already been touched. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but how does that but, compare to what, uh, you know, all the news coming out recently where it doesn't live on right. services anyway that long? But it's so what you've it, spent it, all this energy. It's what they need. It's what they needed at that what time. What they needed to feel comfortable to shopping. To manage, yeah. And to some extent, it was interesting, too, during the pandemic because... Shopping was sort of the only thing people could do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so we had a lot of people coming just because they needed to get out of the house. Yeah. Um, so it was, you know, it was a challenging time, but people were really good about understanding, you know, waiting in line before they came in the store. Um, Respecting people were very people. supportive. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to Chris. Um, and I did want you to touch upon a little bit what the experience was as a teacher. Um, in a neighboring town, high school teacher, um, you know, what was it like? 
what were the student's expectations, what were the parent expectations <laughs> last spring, and then coming back to this past academic year, everybody had to pivot to a different way of teaching. So what was that like for you? Um, well, it was uh, initially extremely confusing. Um, and, you know, thinking about, um, I think, just how perhaps we all sort of assumed we started hearing the news that maybe it wasn't going to reach the U.S. and or that our response would, would um, sort of attenuate uh, how significant the impact would be in the U.S. I still remember I had one particular student in my U.S. history class who was, and she was an anxious kid, um, really bright kid, but had been following the news and was really worried about this virus. And I remember um, saying to the kids, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, and they're, well, well, you know, we're going to leave school. And I said, I don't think that's the case. And sometimes, you know, with <laughs> with sophomores, sort of like with snow days, right? Yeah. There's there's the, if someone gets a, a hint that there might be snow and suddenly we're, we'll be out for a week. There'll be a blizzard. You know, we try to tamp that down. No, no, no. The, even if we think there might be a snow day the next day, you tell them you're going to be in school. So you want them to do their homework, right? Don't don't think you're not going to be. So I kept on saying, oh, no, you know, this isn't, this is going to be the case. And I remember that particular day when I'd made this statement, just trying to reassure my students with what I thought was the right information, although no one really knew. Um, we got called down to a meeting after school. And that would have, that actually marked the last meeting I had in school. That was in the middle of March until um, school started the next year. And the principal mm -hmm. said, I, I can't tell you anything particular, but I just want you to, guys to be aware that. Um, there are these different technologies that we can use for teaching. So just in case these become necessary, and we, he wasn't able to make the statement because the superintendent had to make it. And as we were driving home, we got the message that you know, we were out. It was going to be a week at first, then maybe 10 days, and then eventually it became pretty clear um, we weren't going back. And that meant that we had to shift to, um, to teaching in this remote way. I had never heard of Zoom until this moment. Um, I think at this point I kind of wish I never had. Um, but it proved to be a pretty good tool. Uh, and it was really hard. I mean, think about some of the things that uh, you struggle with when, just when you have students in front of you, um, students with various learning differences, uh, students who are struggling to just access challenging content, yeah. and then imagine not being able to meet with them face to face, and those students not being able to interact with their peers in the same way. Um, levels of anxiety around um, uh, you know, the pandemic layered on top of, I think, the, at least the discourse in my school is that our students are already experiencing an elevated level of anxiety just in general. And then you add this on top of that. Um, so that was really hard. And some students that had, you know, students that we were struggling to connect with um, and, and working really hard to connect with, that became that much harder. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you reach them? And, um, uh, you know, and then again, I think about always students with some differences in learning who need that. Um, you know, a lot of uh, supervision or just simply just need a different kind of approach. Um, we need to sort of be in contact with them, checking up on them all the time. Virtually, uh, you know, impossible to do in yeah. that new format. Um, but we did the best we could with it, learned all kinds of new technologies, screencasting and, um, you know, using Zoom and so forth and so on. And, uh, and then as we moved into the fall, we all worked really hard over last summer too to try to figure out what we were going to be doing. Exactly. It was this hybrid yeah. model. You know, half the students in, half the students at home. Um, which meant sometimes I was teaching a class to students that were there, and some of the students were on the computer. And then in some cases, I was developing separate assignments for the students that were home. Um, and even the students that were in school were uh, you know, masked and separated from each other. Um, so there was that, even, even in the physical space, there was a real sense of isolation and separation, I think. Um, and so I, I think about two populations of this. I think about it. the seniors that I had, um, who their senior year this year was a very unusual year, the, the, their junior year, leaving, yeah. you know, and then coming back in this very unusual way. And then they had, we, we ended the hybrid model after April vacations. So they had maybe two, you know, maybe six weeks. Just like Arlington, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was basically their yeah. sort of upper class experience was about, you know, six Once, weeks. Yeah. Um, and some of them hadn't seen classmates for, you know, a really long time. And then there were sophomores that had essentially done half of, a little more than half of their first year. And then, basically, we're all coming back together right before their junior year. Um, and I think that just leaves a lot of questions: is you know what's coming next? Um, but I will say this: you know, I'd, I'll just end with this. I was so impressed with so many of my students and their resilience. So many of my colleagues worked so hard. All my colleagues worked really, really hard as well. Um, but you know, we just went to a pass/fail model, and um, okay. essentially, you just yep. had to sort of produce something. Yep. 
<laughs> and you know, because it was virtually impossible yeah. to grade, you know, it's very hard to do and to assess what's going on. And I had some students that absolutely transcended themselves and, and just produced incredible work, even when, you know, everyone kind of knew the grade was going to be a P anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, which sort of, in, in a strange way, sort of, I reinforced a certain sense of admiration I have for my students, how hard they work, and it kind of reminded me that I do take this stuff seriously. It isn't just about grading. So actually, I'm going to go backwards, starting with you, because I have certain words that came out of your storytelling, your yeah. one-hour storytelling interviews with me, and yours was intractable. But if you had to think of a word that sort of encapsulates your experience over the course of the pandemic and now, what would it be? One word that encapsulates the experience of the pandemic? Oh, it's just something that comes up. Um, I'm not going to say unprecedented. Yeah, so sorry. Um, yeah, uh, I think... Exhausting. I mean, it could be negative, it could be positive, it could be inspirational, just something that, you know... Well, I think the word that comes to me is social. Social, And, yeah. I, you know, if I can add another word, you know, another few words, <laughs> the importance of the social, you know? But just yeah. all things social. It just the means you reflect on that. Yeah. Yeah. Jan, if you had to think of that, and your word was madness, because I was thinking about, you know, your place of work and what was going on there. Yeah. Um, but if there's something that you take away from the uh, year and, you know, the pandemic sort of lockdown year. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I really do think it's sort of the supportiveness that the community, you know, and customers and colleagues all sort of pulled together and, you know, under circumstances where everything was changing yeah. every day, okay. people really hung in there, rolled with the punches, supported each other to make it work. Pietra, your word was compromised. Um, and I was thinking of public health in general, but is there something, you know, you would say similar or differently to that? I think my overall take is community. Yeah. So I think in a lot of ways, um, we've seen how community can be supportive, how important community is for the social, how people found different ways and new ways of connecting and reconnecting. I managed to connect with a lot of old friends that I hadn't spoken to in a long time that would mm -hmm. not have happened otherwise. Um, but also, uh, community to me, partly a lesson from this that I'm hope, sometimes I get discouraged, but I hope we'll learn is that sometimes you're, we live in a very individualistic country and the pandemic has shown us that we need to be there for each other. Mm -hmm. What I do affects everybody around me, not just me and my family. So, um, yeah. so living and being in community, I think is, is something that has really come out of this. That's great. Adam, your word was humanity, and you mentioned that in a, in a, in the interview when we talked vis-a-vis -vis the humanity of everybody else in the town administration. So I'm wondering, um, on a no, more personal note, you know, what would you think of that would come to mind for yourself? So I guess <clears throat> probably to tie into humanity, I would say resilience mm -hmm. or resilient. Mm -hmm. oh, you took my uh, word. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it too. You can say it as well. <laughs> um, you know, I just feel like I know resilience yeah. can be um, a bit of a tricky word mm -hmm. in the society we're living in today, but I feel like humanity has demonstrated itself to be obviously quite vulnerable, but exceptionally resilient in the face of all this hardship over the past 18 months. So I, yeah. I think I would, that, that would be my word today. Yeah. So I'm totally taking resilient, but I'm going to take it a slightly different direction, right. if I might, which is like, we talk about the resilience of humans, which I think has absolutely been, we've shone a light on it. But I think that there's a weird way in which our society, organizationally, from a business standpoint, really values efficiency and having minimum stock on hand so you don't have too much that rolls over to the next day, getting answers at the last moment as necessary for what's happening. And I think organizationally, we need to put a value on our society being resilient and having stockpiles yeah. and having yeah. sick days and having these things to deal with the realities that we have to deal with. And the forces arrayed against it um, are pretty strong, right? Like it's, it's, it's expensive to be resilient. Uh, it turns out it's really expensive not to be. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, one of my second sketches on the virus series, which was you know my Instagram mode of starting this project, the second one that I showed you earlier, which looked like a plant, um, its title was Resilience, and it was done on the second day, the day mm -hmm. the school, you know, the day after the school's mm -hmm. lockdown. 
and just thinking about this idea within this chaos and uncertainty, how do you, you know, stay strong and hold everything together. But uh, Can I ask you yes, a question? Go ahead. Just yeah. after having interviewed so yeah. many people and, and having heard so many stories and heard people, you know, choose their word, yeah. what would be the word you would choose? Um, it's tricky. <laughs> um, so I had 365 words. I never actually ever latched onto one. And for me, it was the combination of all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that would be my response. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This has been Talk of the Town at ACMI. Mm -hmm.